Good evening. We have a quorum. We'll call a planning board meeting to order. And first up for general information, Mr. Dwyer. That would be Doug Sherrill. Uh, Cheryl, is it? Cheryl. You're on mute. There you go. Yes. Hi, uh, Doug Searle. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I work with, uh, my name is Doug Searle. I work with Berkshire Design Group, uh, Civil Engineering Landscape Architecture Firm in Northampton. And we are here tonight because uh, we'd like to officially submit a special permit application uh, on behalf of uh, Hyperion Systems. And uh, Joe, uh, I'm going to um, mispronounce uh, his last name. Tchaikovsky. Uh, Kakowski, thank you. No, uh, Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky, thank you again. Um, hope I'm getting it right this time. Joseph Kikowski. Joseph Kikowski. Chai, Chai. Tchaikovsky, thank like you. Chinese Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky. So uh, the project is, uh, are, are you familiar with this project at, yes. this, at this juncture? Okay. What is it? Um, uh, well, uh, basically, I will uh, uh, state in, in summary the uh, uh, what we have submitted is an application package for a special permit, uh, for administrative review, and uh, also for commercial site plan approval. Uh, there's an application package with a variety of, of materials that describes the uh, solar energy system array um, and uh, uh, it's uh, intention to be a dual use and agrivoltaic uh, dual use ground mounted system to allow for Joe to continue to uh, 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 have uh, productive farming practices uh, uh, that are integrated in the same space as uh, the solar field. Um, and as well as that application package is also uh, a site plan a set of drawings and uh, electrical uh, schematics uh, to explain in detail uh, what is proposed. And um, in short, uh, that, that, is, uh, that is essentially, it's on uh, Joe's back lot uh, off of Shattuck uh, Road. The lot itself is approximately eight and a half acres. The proposed solar field is uh, approximately just under two acres worth, worth of panels. The uh, method for installation for this is uh, taking steel I-beams and using a, a, like a post pounder to insert them in the ground so there are no footings. Uh, and uh, then there's a rotational tracker that is uh, posted on top of those footings and then uh, PV panels that are posted on top of that. Uh, joining also this evening who just jumped on, I just wanna introduce him is uh, Jake Marley. Uh, Jake is representing Hyperion Systems, uh, and uh, Jake is uh, a client of Joe's, and uh, Jake had reached out to us to assist in this special permit planning process. Uh, so, uh, Jake, I was just basically explaining uh, the overall gist of our application uh, and uh, the, the general kind of gestalt of the project. Um, and so at this point, I want to see if anybody has any initial questions uh, about our application, if you've had a chance at all to take a look at it. Um, and if there's any other initial things that uh, maybe you have questions or, or information that you're, that you're curious about in terms of it, this initial submittal. How much power will this generate? How many, how many KW or megawatt? It'll be 447 KW DC, 375 KW AC. So 447 KW. Okay. I just need that for the, uh, when I put the legal notice in, I will, because the price of legal notices has been all over the place and going out of sight, our standard costs used to be $325 for the application fee. That doesn't even come close to pay the advertising fee anymore. So what I've been doing is putting the, putting the notice into the Gazette getting a price and then charging you that plus a, a little bit extra. Okay? okay. So I should have, I've got the application downloaded a copy of myself for myself. I will put this into the Gazette within the next couple of days. And when I get the price, I will forward you the application with the price. Who should I mail this to so that you can get a copy to the town clerk? Uh, you could mail it to Berkshire design group. Okay, who, who would Berkshire design? Um, you can mail it to myself, Doug Searle at, at Berkshire Design Group. Um, okay. uh, 
uh, and you want, are you postal mail or email? It'll be email. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it is, it we, we have it. Uh, Jim, great. when I, I got, okay. Yeah, I've got from... it. okay. Yeah. Doug Sorrell at Berkshire, to Doug at Berkshire design. Okay. I've got it. Exactly. All exactly. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, um the one... public, here, public sure, hearing ahead. will be scheduled for June 7th at 6 45 PM. That's the first Tuesday in June. Okay. Now, how are you going to get me the mailing labels? Uh, I would you like the mailing labels on uh, envelopes ready to go, or uh, how would you prefer? Either envelopes or or, or like uh, regular mailing labels, whichever is better, whichever is more convenient for you. Uh, either either one is fairly convenient. We can print them and have them uh, delivered. Uh, to uh to town hall if that's the case how about two sets of envelopes okay and you can just put them in a planning board mailbox at the town hall all right making an assumption that you'd like them stamped Pardon? or not would you like them stamped that would be great okay is there any intention to include battery storage on this facility thank you no there is not any intention at this point <laughs> and just because I don't really know one kilowatt from another, how does it compare to other large facilities in town you relatively? Thank you. So this project is going to be approximately 2.2 acres and we're spreading it out um, a little bit more than what traditional solar would be in order to keep the ground below in production. <laughs> Uh, right. uh, for your for a general reference, um, about eight kWDC is what a, a average U.S. residential home um, would consume for one hundred percent power. Uh -huh. My question is probably for Doug: uh, what what animals are going to be un, uh, under the solar panels? That's a great question. Actually, I'm going to uh, uh, pass that over to Jake. They've been working with Joe, uh, a little more scrutiny on developing a farm plan to go, go uh, along with this. While, you, while you're there, the other part of that question is the National Heritage Spotted Turtle. Hmm. Thank you. I, I, I see Joe has joined. Um, I will start. And, and um, we've gone through the NHESP process, and I believe that we included their uh, determination letter that there's not going to be any impact uh, caused by the array for the spotted turtle in this area. Uh, the, the farm plan itself, and, and we can expand on this, uh, it's going to be row crops. Uh, in year one, it's going to be broccoli production underneath the array. And uh, on that 2.2 acres, we've also identified um, uh, zucchini squash as a potential crop. And the reason we've uh, selected those two is because of the research in part done by UMass Amherst, um, researching under the, the dual use array in South Deerfield and other uh, commercial arrays uh, in, in geographies across the world, similar to climates here in uh, Massachusetts. So the chickens are, are done. We, we've um, moved past the chickens for, for now, at least. Yes, we're, we're uh, on, on to vegetable production. Good idea. Okay. Any, um, other question? Any other questions from anybody? I do have a question for the board. Uh, I'm, uh, one question is, uh, there is a fee that is to be determined. Would that be determined uh, at the public hearing? No, the fee that I was talking about would be the legal notice plus a little bit. Okay, there is okay. not a uh, special permit application fee. That is, that will be the application fee. Typically, the the special the, the special permit fee covers the cost of legal notice, the mailings, and a little bit and a little bit extra to cover um, things that go on in the town hall to review it. Okay, and. Thank you. Like I said, the biggest the biggest price that we've had is the legal notice, and that has been just going up and up and up. Um, we just put a legal a little legal notice. I mean, you probably are aware of how much legal notices are costing. Mm -hmm. the last legal notice we just put in the paper yesterday for a zoning. It's probably, you know, not that big, but it was five hundred and fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. And you know, typically the ones that we're putting in for the legal notices for the special uh, public special permits has been running, used to run about $190. The last one I put in was 360. 
And I don't know what this was going to cost because it seems like they're just all over. The, they're going up and up and up. Sure. So okay. ra rather than overcharge you and short or shortchange the town, this way, it's a flat. You, we already know what the fees are going to be. And so it just covers the costs. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Um, so. uh, we had another outstanding question. We had reached out to the town treasurer, but we hadn't heard uh, from them yet, which is one of the criteria around uh, uh, some form of financial surety related to decommissioning. Uh, if the site was ever, you know, at some point, if it needed to be decommissioned, that some sort of bond or uh, escrow account. And we wanted to see if it was possible to find out more information about that. We have approved several of these. So there are decommissioning bonds in place. I believe that's what most people are using. Okay. Okay. Um, so one other thing, Doug, when, um, when you file with the town clerk, you're going to bring her two sets of paper, two paper sets of this application. Um, one is for her and you'll ask her very nicely to give the other set to the fire chief. Yeah, that's okay. how we make sure it gets to him. Okay. That's all. That's the complete set of plans that you put on the uh, link to the websites. Yep. Okay. I, well, is is that is that uh, I, I would assume that's the case. Is that right, uh, Bill? Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, I I have forwarded your your uh, link to everyone on the board and to the building inspector, and we'll forward the link to everyone else who is supposed to get a copy. We used to hand out paper plans. We'll forward the link. Mm -hmm. I know from past experience that the fire chief particularly likes to roll out plans on the table. Okay. So that's why I'm asking you to, and there needs to be a copy for the town clerk so that okay. when Jim puts the legal notice in the newspaper, it says anyone who wants to see what the plans look like can see them at the town clerk's office. Okay. So we Is have there, to have one set there. So um, there's no longer a need for, as the bylaw states, uh, nine copies for Mr. Okay. Review or? No, we don't either. Just, just, just those two okay. papers, just, just those, those two, two sets. Yeah. Okay, Actually, great. we ultimately should have a third set for the planning board file. Okay. Um, but just hold off on that because we'd like that to be the final, the final set showing any changes that we negotiate over the next few months. Yeah. Okay. Um, and one other question, is there uh, uh, a desire or need for there to be a third party peer reviewer? And if so, uh, the uh, civil engineer, uh, one of our principals who's a civil engineer, uh, Chris Chamberlain in our office, wanted to uh, recommend uh, another uh, engineer uh, known uh, as uh, Bucky Sparkle, who has, uh, we've worked with, and we've done peer reviews for him, he's done peer reviews for us, um, but he's not on the official list that the town of Hadley has. And so we wanted to inquire if, um, he is, uh, he's very good. Uh, he is not the most expensive. So uh, that's one of the two parts why uh, Chris thought he's very credible, but also reasonable. Yep. We just had a very good experience with them. And we did have, um, have found out that one of the people on the list, uh, Doucette and Associates apparently has uh, packed up shop in uh, mm -hmm. Massachusetts. So um, but why don't we handle this separate, let's, the two questions. Um, we have not required peer review in every installation, uh, especially where there is not any change in grading, slope, what have you. Um, when it's been clearing a hillside, we have. Okay. You're, so. you're basically in a flat area, and you're so, and I believe Mr. Sykowski owns most of the land around this site. Mm -hmm. So that runoff onto 
somebody's property is really not really a concern because the water is going to run off of the solar panels onto Mr. Sikowski's property. It's not going to be migrating to somebody, you know, 50 feet away. He's, 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 he's almost an island out there by himself. So I don't think we need to worry as too much about runoff. And really, that's the biggest concern of a peer review. Okay. And as far yeah. as the electricals and everything else, we're not, we don't, we're not going to review that anyway. That's something that the electrical is going to look, the electrical inspector is going to look at, the building inspector is going to look at. Um, that's not part of the review anyways. So um, it really doesn't, to my opinion, it doesn't really make sense to have a peer review on this for those reasons. Okay, great. So, okay. Okay, thank you for clarifying uh, uh, both those issues. Um, so as a separate matter, if uh, you're the man, Mr. Chamberlain from your office wants to just send an email to us uh, suggesting that we add uh, a Bucky Sparkle to our list, we'll take it up at, a, at another meeting. Yeah. Or if, uh, if he want, if Bucky Sparkle wants to just send us an email asking to be added to the list. Yeah, that might be better. That might okay. be better. Yeah. Okay, fair. Yeah. Uh, I'll pass that on to Chris and uh, have him uh, coordinate that, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, that would be good. Thank okay, you. Good. Sure, of course. Good suggestion. Thank you. Well, that's all the questions that we had at this time. Um, okay. I will get, I, by the end of the week, you should have the information on the fee and the, everything else for the legal notices. So then you can, before, you don't have to, you can file the, paperwork anytime in the next couple of weeks does that okay. be immediately okay great then we'll wait for the fee and then we'll deliver the two sets uh, along with the fee very good okay. okay perfect thank you great thank you all thank you all. yep thank you hey joe are you gonna buy any electric tractors uh, I, I i can't get a long enough extension cord <laughs> Uh, so Tom Corbett was in next, but uh, I believe you uh, you're here, Tom, Thank for the uh, ZP battery. So we'll be taking that up in a moment anyway. And that brings in um, iPhone, who's identified as Diane Kirby. Did you have a question for the planning board? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Oh. Yes, I do have a question. Um, the zoning board ruled in my favor regarding, um, you know, opening amped up electric rides at the old uh, Rockies building in Hadley on Route 9. And I'm very excited. I can't even tell you how excited I am about that. But um, the um, building uh, administrator, um, was it Tom Quinlan, yes. asked me to come back for one last uh, planning board meeting to discuss uh, parking and my sign. And um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about the sign. And we wanted to also discuss that. I was hoping that you would uh, be okay with me putting a final coat of the purpley pink paint on the outside of the building. Um, possibly not till after the grand opening, but um, I was hoping that you would not, you know, have a problem with me keeping that color. Okay. The the so color the talk, is the color that she's talking about mm -hmm. around the window. She kind of painted like a, for lack of a better term, a checkerboard light purple, and it's it's it actually looks better than the the drab building that was there. Um, I personally don't have a problem with it, but I don't know how the rest of the board feels. Has everybody uh, seen it? Yes, I have. I never look closely at it. You know, usually somebody comes in with a color so that Bill can specifically put down the color in in our in his notice of approval. So there is well, no question in, about in it. In this in this case, we waived the site plan approval, but I, I drove by and it is not not eye catching in any way. Okay. Yeah. Is this uh, two ninety nine Russell? Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it needs another. It needs another coat of paint. 
What's the type of business? Uh, I didn't catch it in the beginning. I'm going to be selling all electric scooters and motorcycles. Oh, that's right. Okay. Great. Imported direct from China. So I'm sure the parking has to do with the uh, displaying of uh, the motorcycles out in, into the parking lots. Is that what the question that Mr. Quinlan had? No, he, he wanted to know how many parking spaces my business was going to be acquiring from the parking lot because the, the other part of the building, which is 6,000 square feet, is also for lease now. And my understanding is they're actually looking for two tenants, not one in that 6,000 square feet. Right. So Tom was concerned about how much parking would be available for everybody. And I told him, I only need seven or eight parking spaces. I mean, the building is pre-existing, non-conforming because it was put up back in the... 1970. No. It was, it was, according to the, the town paperwork, it was built in 1970. 1970, I would have been 16. Um, okay, I thought, I thought that building was put up back in the mid 60s. But anyways, anyway. um, the, uh, I mean, the building hasn't be, really been enlarged or anything since it was built. It, it doesn't meet the two for one parking, but between all the tenants, they're just gonna have to fight for parking space. That's the only thing I can come down with. They're going to, unless they can some way divide up, well, this is for this tenant and this is for this tenant, but that's going to be pretty difficult being it's one big parking lot in front and the side. Yes, plus they have, um, TJ's Rental also has equipment in the parking lot on display as well. So, you know, I yeah. think that w there'll be room for everybody. I mean, it's, good. it's going to kind of be self- uh, limiting because if there's not enough parking, they're going to have the tenants are going to be just one go there. Well, Jim, I, I don't know if we want to give a blank approval because what if uh, plan B for Mr. Falcone is that it's going to be a fast food restaurant and well, uh, there's going to be a lot of automobiles. Uh, well, th th so. that, that, that's something we'll have to address when he comes back in because it's, it's, it has been basically retail. Yep. Two, it's been three retail businesses and right now there's two retail businesses and unknown in the divided the old divided rocky so if he comes in it's going to have to be if he comes in and said we want to put a food establishment in there we may have to say no you can't do that because you don't have enough parking so at this point how how large is your space that you are renting um in my lease it states that i'm renting four thousand square feet the building is 10,000 square feet. Got to think there's 20,000 square feet of parking there. But e even if there isn't, the first tenant, you, um, uh, I have first dibs. You have, you have first first dibs. So the, okay. the owner has spent uh, 8,000 square feet of parking. And okay. Yeah. But like I said, I don't anticipate really having to utilize more than seven or eight parking spaces at any given time. And there's probably at least 22 spark parking spaces there in existence right now. Like one. Okay. I'm curious, who's the supplier of the uh, electric bikes? Or is it domestic, international? They're coming direct from China. Yeah. It's usually China. Silence. Signage. You, are, you mentioned signage. Yes. The uh, sign is being built. It's based on the colors that you see on the building. Um, I sent you a picture when I first approached you back in October uh, with the picture of the sign. Um, it's uh, going to be externally lit. Um, I think it's... Uh, I don't know, it's like um, three by eight or whatever. It's gonna be up in the air on the lowest part of the sign, which is an existing frame. There's an internally lit uh, light there for right now, but we're going to not use that obviously because that's not allowed. But what I was asking for is that I'd be allowed to put a banner 
underneath the sign, which is just a temporary vinyl hanging banner that says basically grand opening April 30th, hopefully. Um, and that's it. And of course, uh, you know, shortly after the grand opening, it'll be taken down. But it's just a vinyl hanging banner. Yep. We've allowed banners for grand opening and special events and stuff like that. Okay. As long as they're not permanent. Right, it's not permanent. Just for the grand opening. It'll be, it'll be two-sided. Now, will the sign be shared by the potential next tenant? Well, they understand that the new tenants are not grandfather to use the existing sign in which I believe there's a scrolling uh, advertisement that can go across. And uh, I think that, uh, I can't remember, I think it was Tom Quinlan and I, or was it Jim Maximowski and I, we've, I've had numerous conversations, uh, said that the scrolling banner is not allowed and uh, we all have no problem with that. Nobody plans on using a scrolling banner anyway. Um, but of course, if the, if the road does get expanded, as they've been talking for years, uh, that whole sign will end up coming down anyway. And then we'll have to erect a new and a much smaller sign. So that's really, in our eyes, it's really not a permanent sign anyway. And my understanding is the big part at the top is not to be used by anybody other than Rockies. Rockies is gone. So any new tenants moving in cannot use the big internally lit part that's at the top because you know that's what uh, what was proposed to me in the first meeting, um, and of course in, in talking with um, I think it was the zoning board that the sign has limited usage capabilities at this point, but that doesn't affect me anyway because I'm using the bottom of the sign which is already there. The part already exists. The frame already exists. I'm going to use an existing frame. I'm going back to the color. Did I hear purple and yellow? Purpley pink. Oh, purple. Pink. It's not really purple. It's not really pink. It's kind of in between. It's not uh, Planet Fitness. That's correct. That's correct. It's not quite that bold. And it's a small sign too. Like I said, it's only like three by eight. <clears throat> How long am I allowed to leave the light, the external lights on to light up the sign? Is that like, that can be lit up 12, you know, 12 hours during the overnight or does it have to be shut off? Because I've noticed a lot of signs are lit up even at night it, externally. It, it, as long as it's not uh, noticeable to the traffic. I don't know how, how bright it's going to be, but there's no residences nearby that I'm aware. Yeah, nobody's living in that house next to the... Uh, is anybody living in that house next to the uh, Rockies there? Yes. There is? Yeah, I think his name is David Chen. He's the owner of the property, and he also okay. owns the wetland. I mean, in the you, you, you could... You could, you could I would say, what hour is you going to be open? Um, that, that is still to be determined. We're not exactly sure yet. It's either going to be weekdays, Wednesday through Friday, either 10 to 5.30 or 11 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. And then weekends are going to be either 10 to 4 or 11 to 4. I haven't exactly determined if I'm going to open at 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. I haven't determined that. Because there may be a house, living, somebody living in a house nearby, I would say that the sign should be shut off no later than 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Okay. I was just concerned because the VAC store on the other side of the house is lit all year, all day long, all night long. If I go by the building at midnight, the VAC store is still lit up, which is on the other side of the house. So a lot of it depends on how bright are the lights. I mean, if they're, if they're not really obtrusive to the nearby property, then you could probably leave them on for a long period of time all okay. night. It's just a kind of a tougher question to say without knowing how bright they are because the back door is lit up, but it's very, if you would, low key lighting. It's not really bright. Mm, I think that that's an, ex an internally lit sign as well, the back door. That, it is. It, it is not a pre existing non conforming sign. Right. It could not be, uh, it could not be done today. Right. But like I said, it's lit up all day long and all night long. So I just wasn't sure if that was okay or not. But you no, know, my sign's not going to be very large and it's not going to look like a landing zone by any means. It's just enough to, to make the colors, you know, um, stick out from the darkness when 
you know, somebody's passing by so that they know I'm there, basically, which is which is the reason why I painted the front of the building is because I do not want a sign on the building. It's not my building. It would cost a lot of money to put a sign on the building and I would have to damage the building. It's not my building. So the landlord and I agreed that I'm not going to put a sign on the building. So I just painted the color so that the people coming in will go to the correct entrance because people are just creatures of habit. And because the other entrance of the 6,000 square foot area is so vast, it just looks like that would be the entrance to the scooter business or the motorcycle business. And it's not. So I just was kind of trying to keep the color when they, when they pull in and see the color of the sign, they're going to notice the color of the building is the same. So without a sign, I'm kind of trying to bring people to the proper entrance without the signage. So I'm trying to match the color basically to the sign. I think it'll work. Opinion of the rest of the board? Um, what about displaying um, your electric rides? Is there a setback? Is the existing parking lot already within the setback? Well, actually, that's going to change when the when the highway widens, is it? Or it's not going to encroach upon that? What I was planning on doing, which I wanted to talk to you next, because I forgot to mention that at the beginning of the meeting, because I knew there were four things I wanted to talk about. <clears throat> I would like to be able to display at least two or three machines on the front of the grass, right along with the sign during business hours only. And okay. then at the end of the business hours, all the machines get rolled back inside. So basically they would only either be on display between say 11 a.m. <clears throat> and 5 p.m. weekdays, which I'm gonna be closed on Mondays and Tuesdays anyway. And then on the weekends when I'm open, let's say uh, 11 to four. The, a couple of different machines will be on display. Uh, maybe a couple feather flags, uh, you know, mentioning electric, <clears throat> excuse me, electric uh, motorcycles and scooters. And um, those will also be taken in at the end of the day as well. How heavy are these things? Which, what's that? The scooters. It depends on which one. I have they're gonna one. Be on the, they're going to be right on the, right on the uh, road. <laughs> and that's not, not, really the that's road. not allowed. That's not allowed. The sign is actually closer to the parking lot than it is to the road. So I'm just more concerned about theft. <laughs> no, but just no, the this this has been tried before. So the signs have to have a special 15 feet setback. But people try to display all their wares almost on Route 9. And and so no displays are allowed. At least it has to be 50 feet back frontage. Yeah. Yeah. But but the problem is, is that. The parking lot is only well. What, that's that's, a, that's a problem, feet. but it's not. As far as I'm concerned, it's not acceptable. Okay. Yeah, we don't. So know I can what... display them in the parking lot then. Or no, I can't because it's only 25 feet from right outside the building, like the bicycle people do. There might be a peninsula as you between the entrance and the parking where you could put it on that grass and still so, stay. At this point, we do not know enough of what the configuration is going to look like when Mass Highway is through with reconstructing Route 9 at that point. Good point. And um, what is now grass that looks like it may go with the Rockies property may actually be owned by the state. So we can't do a blanket. Sure, you can put it on the grass. Uh, I think until, if you want to come back after the dust settles, we can talk about how far forward you could put one or two, but I think at the moment it's probably best to, you know, we can't give you permission to put them on state property. And depending on where that line is, and I don't know where it is, um, um, there may not be any grass that you can put it on. So I think we but, have to, you know, I'm, I'm okay with putting some out in front of the building, but not that far forward um, until we know what that's going to look like. Okay. I, I was confused about what you were saying. I, I wasn't sure if you were saying that I, 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 I can't put them 
on the grass because of the the frontage rules with the town, or you weren't going to jurors, you weren't going to uh, designate whether I can or can't because it, it it might be the state's property, and then the town doesn't really have the say. So I wasn't sure what you were trying to so say. We're talking about both things. Generally, we want to have things set back from the road. No. Generally, we say no parking in the front 50 foot setback. Pre-existing non-conforming building, yes, they have parking in front. Um, I don't know how much, uh, without looking at a survey, I don't know how much of what appears to be asphalt and what appears to be grass, parking lot, grass, highway, I don't know where the property line is. Mm. So Does, I don't I don't want to blanket say sure put put something on the grass because that may be putting it on state property which isn't ours to to give mm, and it's also but, going to be constructed constructed with a, a bike path and a, a sidewalk on both sides so I don't know what your lot is going to end up looking like um, I think I'd go along with. Dr. Zagrodnik at this point and say, if you want to bring them outside, fine, wheel them outside the door. But, you know, the further forward you go, you're in, um, and we, we don't know what's what out there. Mm. And it's going to be a construction zone anyway. Yeah. Number one, my lease is only for another 18 months. We don't even know if the state's going to get started on the construction in the next 18 months. They were talking about doing it for a year. So we don't really know what, what's going to happen there. Yep. Um, number two, I noticed that the, the TJ's rentals propane tanks are right up on the road, literally like within like, you know, five feet of the, of the, um, what do you call it? The uh, sidewalk. So I wasn't we, sure. It, we are the, not a zoning enforcement board. We are a planning board and we issue planning permits. If you feel that is a violation in any way and contrary to what we're recommending, it's your right to go to the building inspector and ask him to enforce that. It's really so. not that important. It's just that I'm only concerned that if I do display the motorcycles right outside my, my, my door, then I've taken up the eight parking spaces that I am asking the landlord to reserve for me. That's the only thing. So if I cannot display the motorcycles and the scooters, that, that's not really a big issue. It really isn't. Um, the only thing is, is that, um, you know, I, I wanted to make clear what I can and can't do. That's the only thing. So I think we clarified that it probably would be best not to put them outside at all. Like you said, I in order for them to be non-theftable, I would have to, because the only way, depending on the, the type of scooter, they could weigh anywhere between 77 pounds and uh, 400 pounds. So um, I'd have to chain them to the sign, which is on the grass. So since you guys don't like that idea, I'm perfectly okay with it. So uh, it probably won't, nothing will probably end up getting put, put outside at this point then because um, I don't have any way to anchor anything down other than the sign, which was my intention was to anchor them to the sign. But, you know, if I can't, I can't, I don't have a problem with that. So um, we're okay with the color. And we're okay with the externally lit sign. We're okay with the banner and we're okay with the parking. And we all agree that if the scooters cannot be um, displayed somewhere where um, they're close to the building and not theftable, then I'll just keep them inside because that's where they're going to actually end up being anyways inside. All of them are going to always be inside. There'll be nothing on the property when the, the business is closed. Very good. Okay. Fuck. Thank you, Diane. So we had previously voted to waive further site plan approval. So I don't know if we need to actually do anything except uh, we now noted, answer these questions. Right. Very good. Okay, then. Very so good. I'll be meeting with the select board tomorrow. I, I believe that will be my last uh, my last meeting, and uh, my grand opening is planned for April thirtieth. So that looks good. April thirtieth looks like a um, you know a goal. 
Okay. Good Thank luck. Good luck. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Next, Mr. Dwyer. Uh, that is it for walk-in business. Okay. Uh, Tom Corbett is here for uh, ZP Battery. Their public hearing is continued. Um, but um, you're welcome to go live, Tom, if you want. Uh, I think it probably might make more sense rather than could just blanket launching the public hearing is to have our conversation with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, go over the zoning, proposed zoning bylaws. We do have a draft now, um, which, which I will send you, and you can take a look at it on at the, uh, the proposal for uh, energy storage, but we okay. haven't talked about it as a board yet. Okay, understood. Uh, yeah, it'd probably be that. I think it'd make more sense to talk about the amendment more than diving in. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me just get um, – I should ask before we send this out, everybody on the board has had a chance to look at this yeah, draft. I, I, made, I made a few changes to it, Bill, so let me send you the latest before you send it out. Okay. I was going to wait. I, I was going to send it to the town uh, administrator today, but I left, it would make more sense as opposed to sending them pieces of the amendments to do it just in one sending um, to get them all together at once. Okay. So you have your draft all set for the. Uh, yeah, uh, likewise, what. What I said to you on special permits is, um, yeah, I sent that to everyone as well. Okay. And um, again, I'll make I'll make any changes that we discuss in either of those. Okay. So you're sending me the battery storage and energy storage. Correct. Okay, and I will forward that to Tom as soon as I get it from you. Okay. Okie doke. Um, let's see. Mr. Do we want to, what do we want to do about the uh, continuation for this one, Bill? Just continue uh, it again? Continue. Well, that's what I thought uh, was that as after we discuss the proposed amendment, okay, then Mr. Corbett would have the opportunity to decide whether he wants to continue the hearing or withdraw the application. Okay. And then we can take that up. Okay. I just sent out the revised energy source to everybody. Okay. Yeah, got it.
So is a substantial change the 25 to 33 or? Yeah, that was it. That's, that really is the only difference. What about the maximum size? I did, or I did put a maximum size, didn't I? I am, yeah, it's here now. I don't think there was there previously. Right. Five million yes. lots. Yeah. Okay, and Tom, I have just forwarded it to you. Yeah, I don't. Are we discussing now or? Yeah. Not, well, I mean, very briefly, but the public, I mean, we can talk about it because it's on the agenda, but the public <laughs> hearing is scheduled for our next meeting on all of the zoning amendments. But we, we can, we, because it is on the agenda to talk about um, the zoning articles, we can, we may discuss it tonight if there's any comments. Um, I, I have mixed feelings about the 25 versus 33. I mean, I think that's an economic, I think that, um, if they're going to do it, if they want to make a profit off of storage, it's going to be large enough that, you know, 25% is significant, but anyway, um, I, we might, How do you know? We I might know. Well, I'm not the economist, but that's just my exactly. that's my sense. Um, my thought is we might need a I don't know how, but might need to more be less general about no hazardous chemicals. You know that that's something that could be litigated. You know, you could say is hydrogen peroxide a hazardous chemical. I don't know. But as a practical matter, I don't like getting that specific yeah. because then you're going back to town meeting for a two thirds vote to chase scientific developments. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I, I didn't know if it made sense to say, you know, as listed by DEP or something like that. But So are you agreeing with I don't want to say what you just said, Bill, about being specific. I, I was just replying to Mark's comment about being too specific oh. about hazardous um, chemicals when um, you know we, we don't want to turn this into a chemistry book. No, but I, I you know I, what I was thinking was that if we referenced some other more qualified index, well, that, and it was up to that index. To Mark, you're, you're kind of zoning in on what we did when we're talking about hazardous waste over the aquifer protection district. And that's when Jim came up with the hazardous waste according to the state regulations. Yeah. Was that the way it came up, Jim? Huh? Yeah, the only problem with that one, using that one, is it's called a very small quantity generator and it complies with MS, I guess, MS-13. Um, there is almost nothing that is not listed in MS-13. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't mean to be facetious there, but about the only, the only thing that's not listed is water. <laughs> so, you know. Because it, it, it depends on the quantity. Right. Well, yep. um, even water is hazardous because you can drown in it if there's enough of it. <laughs> it's the, that's kind of a standing joke. It, it's it's it, it's it's. I mean, MS thirteen is. If you have ever seen, I think it's MS thirteen. Um, is hundreds and hundreds of pages. I printed it out about fifteen years ago, and it took up a stack, probably four inches thick. Maybe you no, know, maybe three inches thick. I, I would suggest, Jim, keep it the way it is. And now, uh, all due respect, Mark, uh, I remember 60 years ago, people said fluoride was a poison. And uh, 
you had to be more specific on how how did it poison you so it it gets into more than you really would care to but uh unless we're challenged on it i mean whether it's lithium or or they're all hazardous now i was uh and the the research is still being done because they know there are problems with batteries there's no question about it yeah i mean we, we got by by being gener general, we can it gives us some wiggle room. We're not trying to prohibit stuff. We're trying to just control it so that it's not nasty and hazardous, to really dangerous to the environment. Well, I, I mean, like the propylene glycol discussion. Right. I mean, but, even propylene glycol. If you go to MS thirteen, that's 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 a dangerous chemical. Getting back to uh, so. 33 verse 25, I, I, I guess the key number is five megawatts. How reasonable is 33 or 25, given that the maximum size is five megawatts? So you're saying that the maximum battery size is five megawatts. So 25 or 33 percent has to be generated on site. How reasonable is that? I don't know. Where are you seeing that the maximum size is five? That was the very last the line. Bottom. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so the question is, how much, is that a reasonable number for 25 or 33%? So you're saying the solar system, solar array has to generate, if you have it on a non-industrial site, has to generate at least uh, 1.25 to say 2 million, get me? Yeah, I think either one, 25 or 36 is arbitrary and capricious. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's, it's we don't a number, know. It's, a, it's don't originally know. was 50%, then we dropped it, and then we put it back up. It's a yeah. number to be discussed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. well, you know, we don't know. We, right. We don't know. So a maybe five percent arbitrary, you know. It, I don't it's know. It's a good starting point. That's fine. Yeah. It's so a we're five have to feel our way through this. If my math is correct, a five megawatt uh, storage would be uh, would require a fifteen megawatt solar field to support it. Yeah. So if storage capacity shall not exceed five megawatt and right. That is, um, um, and you have to have a minimum of thirty-three percent of the store of the energy generated on site. So that would take a fifteen megawatt. No, field. no, you, you've gone the wrong point. You're in the wrong place. It, it would be one and two thirds megawatts. One point six five. One point yeah. six five megawatts. Yeah. yeah. You, if it's thirty three percent, you multiply by three instead of dividing by three. Right. <laughs> Leave it to the two guys that know some math, huh, Mark? A <laughs> comment, or is this your sure. discussion? Yeah. Okay. No, absolutely. Um, yeah. No, I just wanted to kind of discuss the. The, the goals in the, I guess, the direction of the industry um, as a whole, as a renewable energy industry. Um, I think making, I believe you guys already allow solar plus batteries. Is that correct? Yes. And so I don't, I guess I, I guess I just don't see the, the need for you guys to create your solar plus, your battery plus solar, because it's already covered in your solar purview. If guess if you wanted to put that um, percentage requirement in with your solar plus batteries that that might be a good spot for it but as a whole uh the industry is not going out and developing solar in order to put batteries out um we're we're moving away from solar ground mounted solar as an industry um and a sector within the commonwealth and they're moving towards standalone systems so this the standalone aspect is really where your battery storage is coming in predominantly i understand that still some people are going back. Uh, some of the some of the Clean Peak program um, qualifications can allow you to go back to projects um, that were built after 2019 to put batteries onto um, in order to 
uh, qualify for the program. But as a whole, um, the standard moving forward with no incentive to build solar, there's no, there's nobody's going to be putting in batteries and, and having um, solar panels with them. Um, as kind of it's a kind of flop from kind of where the industry's at. The industry has been for the last four years at a spot where they put solar in and then add the batteries, um, not vice versa, and it's not going that direction. Um, so just we wanted to, I don't know, I guess just explain that for your point of view, just so I think it's unnecessary for you to put um, a energy storage system with on-site solar in your bylaws because it's already covered. Um, on your solar side of things. But um, energy storage as a whole, I see you want to restrict it down to uh, just industrial. Um, I don't know the mindset around that. Um, although I think it's not really aiding in any goals with the state. Um, it's kind of going against it. You're secluding it to only one feeder within the town where there's probably eight different um, feeders coming off of three different substations that all come from outside of Hadley. Um, there's no power coming from Hadley itself. Uh, it's two substations in Amherst and a substation in East Hampton is where all the power comes from. So you've got multiple, and when I say multiple, I mean three different feeders coming off of two substations and at least one feeder coming off of that East Hampton um, substation. So the real goal here with with energy storage isn't isn't to come in and put it everywhere um and, and the goal is not to have it have 15 different systems on one line uh say like you might see with some solar systems throughout the solar fields throughout the years where developers come in they put in as much solar as they possibly can on a line and that might look like six or seven projects um the way that this stuff's working the way that ever sources um, addressing it as well as national grid is that each individual feeder um, so a 13.8 line can hold they, they allow 10 megawatts worth of capacity taken up for renewable energy um, with that they would allow only that much energy storage on that line they're not going to let 100 so like me as a developer I can't just come in and put a 15 megawatt system on their line and have them deal with it. Um, so this stuff all goes through a strong vetting process, um, studies upon studies, hundreds of thousands of dollars in studies. And what happens at the end of it is they, they, they look at what their infrastructure is now, um, if they need upgrades and what's currently being produced on the line. So that's, that's like step one when we go to look at a project is what's being currently uh, gener distributed and distributed generation on the feeder. So solar production predominantly um, in your area, as well as most of Massachusetts, there's some hydro here and there throughout the state. Um, uh, but as far as renewables, this, this program speaks to solar in general, um, for the most part, it does have to do with wind and it does have to do with hydro as well. But as a whole, they've created these charging windows um, the DOER, the DPU, Eversource, National Grid, Unitil have all worked together on this document to create the Clean Peak Energy Standard um, that's been pushed through the state house and such. Um, so really the goal here is to absorb that solar production that's on the line. So when I go to the solar line, like um, over on Breckenridge, I go to Eversource's mapping on their website, it's all public information. Um, it tells you how much distributed energy is on each line, um, and it, it tells you what substation that line goes to. You can track the three-phase feeders throughout the whole town and into wherever they go. Um, so we targeted this. I'd actually, this project fell into my lap from the landowner, um, so that we, that's why we ended up submitting it to Eversource as um, kind of a trial with them and see how they wanted to respond to it. So it's been in a study with National with Eversource for quite some time, but besides the point, um, they only are going to allow a five megawatt project on that line as there is only, I believe it's like 5,416 kilowatts um, connected to that line specifically. Um, so I guess it, I just wanted to give that perspective of like, you're not gonna see, um, 
battery storage systems popping up like solar. Um, and I guess the, the real goal here too is to move away from this large scale um, cutting down of trees, um, implementing these half acre sites, third of an acre sites is really the goal, um, not to cut down more trees and put in uh, 1.6 megawatts worth of solar panels and really kind of go against and um, go against what we're trying to do here is kind of lessen the burden on the towns and um, keep your green spaces and and make it more energy efficient and really build the energy the infrastructure of every source and all that stuff for the reliability and sustainability of the system um, and really defer the the cost of upgrades and the, defer the need of upgrades uh, for the near future by implementing battery storage on these three phase lines. So just wanted to give a little insight um, just as far as where the industry's at and maybe help you wrap your head around things as far as I know you guys, I don't, you probably don't need help wrapping your head around things, but um, just a little insight from my experiences through the boards and towns that I've been working through. And I've been working with the town of Lancaster and Athol on bylaw amendments as well. And just giving me input where it's, where it's welcomed, I guess. Thank you, Tom. Oh. On a standard for a standard stand alone solar system, about how many, uh, how much power is generated per acre? Per acre? So my 10, 10 megawatts of weight on a solar system? Yeah. On one, one acre, how much, how many solar panels, how much, how many, how much power would an acre of solar panels generate? So can I reverse that? So like one megawatt worth of power takes up a roughly five acres of land. Okay. So there, there's a there's a big there's a big difference in like what the, the the solar stuff is taking up a large amount of land, which is where you've really you've seen the towns and the townspeople throughout all of Massachusetts, out by me here as well in Central Mass. Uh, really come out with the pitchforks in the last few years about right. setbacks, views, stuff like that. Um, so the town, the state has really eased away from solar over the years um, and really now moving into um, the energy storage aspect. And you see it, it's going to be popping up everywhere. I just spoke with a gentleman tonight that um, is doing one down in Agawam. He actually spoke with, I believe, Tommy here. Um, he got my name through it all came out about that we were talking about it at Hadley here so I mean they're they're coming everywhere um not necessarily everywhere I, I know I tend to say things like that, but, um, just, just give me that number again one megawatt of solar requires how many acres five. roughly five acres okay it, it, and it, it changes as time goes on panels panels produce more and they get more efficient right. but technology efficiency right yeah exactly so roughly 225 kW per acre, right? Or wouldn't it just be 200? What's the biggest solar field we've got in Hadley? Glaze? Well, I think it's five acres. We're, we're, we limit it to five acres, Mike. Yeah. Probably around a megawatt. So well, I, think I, don't, I don't think then this is unreasonable with the 25 or 33%. Yes, it, it's too much. Yes, because if we limit it to five acres, they can't put it in. So we're gonna to have to reduce that number to closer to 10%. Yeah, and then just going with that, I mean, I don't know if it's worth you as a board to address it within a energy storage bylaw versus a solar bylaw allowing X amount of storage, or if you just leave it alone and say, because realistically to qualify for these programs, you have to produce a certain amount of energy. Um, so if you're doing a solar plus batteries for the Clean Peak, you have to produce 75% of that energy. Um, you, have to you have to store, sorry, 75% uh, of that energy on site. Um, so you have to have, so you have, one say you have a one megawatt field uh you have to store 75 percent of that on um your project so they make it so they're restricting they're already starting to restrict the solar production by with allowing batteries in moving towards just getting into batteries 
as a renewable energy uh, development source. I'm just looking right here online. It says 19% of the electricity generated in Massachusetts is generated by solar. That could be correct. Uh, so, I haven't so looked basically at the figures 80 percent of what's going into these batteries is non-solar, non-green. Maybe a little water, but not much, unless it's coming from Canada. What's the goat milk? No, that's not factual, though. So the, the way that they separate the goat's milk from the cow's milk, Mark, is from the EDCs and the DPU going through and creating these uh, charging windows. And uh, I can show you what those look like, too. I have the document for the, the um, Clean Peak Energy Standard. But generally, it's while the solar is producing and while the solar is not producing. And then further, uh, Eversource will further restrict each project individually. So individual projects have different charging windows, different abilities to operate. Um, you can't just hop on their line and take energy off of it and say that you're gonna sell it back to them. Uh, there's a huge long vetting process. There's a still the statement of qualifications that goes along with all the smart programs and this SREX, all that. These projects go through that whole spiel as well. Um, and really, it's really up to the state as to how they want to separate that. And that's how they separate it is through the charging coincident and the charging coincident is with the charging windows. Well, I still feel like I need to represent the NIMBYs in our town that would not want to raise their kids with a, you know, five megawatt battery next door. So that's why I'm going with not in a residential area. And I'm, I'm suggesting I'm, I'm pro battery, just NIMBY. So that's why I thought, and I thought that industrial made sense because you're more likely to have the electrical infrastructure with th three phase legs and all that to support it, so. Yeah, but then going back to your economics, comment it's more expensive to put these things in an industrial zone because land costs more there than you know mm. oh, the, the i keep on getting <laughs> coming back to the fact that we are allowing battery storage as yeah. an adjunct to a solar field yeah yeah um so i guess i, I do accept that our definition did not allow a battery only storage facility um, but I just don't see the fact that if there were a solar field, you could add batteries to it in a residential area. I don't see the distinction with having a similar size battery installation by itself. So I would, uh, I would not go for the, the minimum contribution of a solar field. I'm okay with a standalone battery only uh, energy storage system. It is by special permit. So if someone wanted to put it basically in the empty building lot between your house and my house, that's one thing. Putting it in a gravel bank um, that is, it is an industrial site. Um, so I would, uh, no, I, I, I wouldn't put in that limitation. I would just leave it that energy storage systems um, shall be permitted in all districts where solar power systems are permitted with appropriate permitting. It leaves a lot of discretion up to the board too, especially with siting. And, and like I worked with Athol and the way that we ended up having to work it in with Athol is through an overlay not that it might make, I don't think it really makes sense in your town because um, I think that you guys could have a general say as to uh, setbacks and stuff can can change um, and not being um, so close to a residence or however you may see fit. Um, some towns have gone that direction with staying 200 feet from a home. Um, so there's, there's options as far as responsibly placing these. And, and when I was first approached with by uh, the landowner, um, we were pre we were talking about another project um, at hand prior to him mentioning that's this parcel. And when I looked at it, I really I saw the property and I, I thought 
really what better spot in that part of Hadley could you put a project? Um, and that's kind of why we just ended up pursuing it. Uh, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. A lot, almost all my projects that I've got in this portfolio, it, that's that's been the goal is to keep them out of sight, out of mind, um, and not really endangering anybody around or um, causing any harm to the grounds. Just because they're out of sight doesn't mean they're not there. <laughs> No, right, but the go, but coming from permitting solar in the past two years, it's been quite challenging with buffers and screening, and uh, these these sites are they're just night and day between the solar. The I, I think I think the view might be right or wrong is that a battery system is a bit more sinister than a solar panel. So currently, we could somebody could come along and put a battery on every solar system through the AI yeah. district. And yeah. you'd have batteries in 15 different areas versus one, really. Um, but that's just just a point of view, that's all. Well, is, is, is there any reason to put a battery on your solar system if you can't sell the electricity to Eversource? Uh, the battery system benefits you because you can sell it to them during certain times. Um, so, but, but, the, you, but the only reason you would put one is is if you could sell it back to the grid, correct? Well, that's how solar operates. Yeah, that's how so, that's how so, solar works. They sell it to the grid. Um, and but, you just said that EverSource isn't going to be buying from everybody. You just can't go in and put a battery system in and expect that they're going to be buying your solar from you. Your, your electricity from right no this project's in with eversource it's being studied with eversource it's been in a study with eversource for a year and a half um so your so comment is, just about two minutes ago about everybody putting a battery on your individual solar field is not correct because there'd be well, no point they, in doing that he said there's a there's a capacity and i i do think they want to encourage it because their system is not going to be able to generate enough as the, as the demand continues to grow and we want to get greener, so. Yeah. It is encouraging battery coupling uh, with existing solar. Uh, so that is wrapped up into this Queen Peak Energy Standard too, as well, um, to aid in that. But that really comes down to the system operator at the time. That's not really like a new development. That's more of a going back to you as a planning board and um, bringing site plans and um, modifying those. And that, it's a lot harder of a process to do, especially with the EDCs. Um, and really over the past two, three years, National Grid, not, not that it's ever sourced, but National Grid on the other side of um, things has been requiring batteries with solar. Um, and that's just because they can't handle the solar production and they need the batteries to offset it. Um, and you'll, you'll, you're, that's where you're starting to see the need for these batteries is that we've developed so much solar in all these parts of towns, small towns, big towns, cities, all over Massachusetts. Um, doesn't really matter what the zip code is. You can pretty much say that the saturation of solar throughout the entire state. And with that brings a lot of energy loss on the lines. Um, it brings a lot of hosting capacity down. So you inhibit the ability to connect big Amazon buildings, which we're seeing problems with south of me right now. You got big buildings of Amazon coming in. They need high power, um, big Walmart buildings, distribution centers. They all need big power. Um, and they're, they're now finding that they have to bring new feeders and infrastructure to these buildings because they've allowed so much solar over the years and that's where these batteries come in and offset that load um and really allow more hosting capacity on these lines what, what you're telling me is that there's too much supply it's not that there's too much supply it's just that it's not managed efficiently um and it's something that they've been seeing coming and that's why we're at the stage that we are in the in massachusetts of implementing battery storage throughout the state well, when you subsidize something, everybody's going to want it. This is what's happened. Everybody put the solar panels in, and now farming to, to makes, solar. Makes I've no, been, system makes no sense at all. I've been a, yeah, it, most things that are good. Ask, um, ask Jimmy Max what his electricity bill. No, no, no front intended. But you know, even my nephew put it in. You know, he's a right winger, and he put the sucker in on his roof because you're subsidized. 
Sure. And, and the, so the market isn't telling you what to do because you've got government subsidies in there. And that's the last of my lecture. OK. <laughs> so well, I think we've kind of been over our heads over here. I mean, either we're going to go with Jim's proposal or uh, there's so many variables. So, so part of why I was bringing this up in conjunction with Ken being with us was, you know, to get some input on, uh, uh, we're, this is not the public hearing on these articles, that no. will be in two weeks, but we want to be sure that if they're technically accurate because they're supposed to go off to town council as part of the warrant uh, tomorrow. So, uh, Is, does anyone see any technical deficiencies in what Jim has drafted? And you said, Jim, you wanted to reduce that to minimum of 10%? I'm, I'm actually going to reduce it to 5%. Because if you put a 5 megawatt system in, and it's going to be 10%, they're going to need two acres of solar panels. That's still a lot of solar panels. I think if it's five percent and you put a five megawatt system in, then it would only be one one only need one acre of solar panels. That's probably more a more reasonable number to meet that. After what Tom has said, if, if five acres produces one me, one megawatt, and they put in a five megawatt system and they need seven and a half acres of uh, solar panels, that's that's not a reasonable number. Whereas I think one acre would be a much more appropriate number for that. You know, solar generation in, in the, in at least Massachusetts, where having a solar panel in every backyard is very similar to Mao Zedong's putting a, a iron smelter in every backyard, okay? Clearly the efficiencies aren't there and you should have been going in retrospect bigger and not smaller. Okay, let's get back to the text. It's too late now. <laughs> let's get back to the text. Um, does anyone feel the way that I do that there's not, I, I see no problem with a battery only system if we change the definition to allow it? Does I think I'd rather go with Jim's 5%. Does any, anybody agree with Bill? Oh, bring us, give me the elevator speech on that again, Bill. You're saying- We allow Bill, batteries everywhere as it is. What's we, wrong every, with allowing a battery only system? Wherever, wherever we allow solar. Wherever we allow solar presently, we do allow batteries as an adjunct. So we allow batteries everywhere. Why can't we allow battery only everywhere? I think because of the size. <clears throat> there are some great articles in the last couple of months about batteries. And the University of Maryland is doing some research on the batteries because everyone realizes batteries are fickle. We don't have them under control yet. And that ship that uh, got caught on fire off the Azores that was headed for Rhode Island while those oh. automobiles, it was a result of batteries catching on fire. I think they're a little bit more obnoxious than one would suspect. So that's why I'm favoring it probably more in an industrial area, not in every area in town. But you're right, we do allow batteries wherever solar is but you would not for i just mentioned my nephew he wouldn't put a battery system at his house okay because it, it it's not economic to do that however if you allow it wherever solar is allowed then he could put a five megawatt battery system in his backyard the the okay. idea Batteries are becoming more economical for the homeowner to put in with their standard solar system. Ah, right. Okay. They're, they may not quite be there yet, but the cost is coming down greatly. I couldn't tell you 
where that stands, but I've been reading about that, that there, there, there's more and more homeowners putting in batteries. How economical it is, I don't know. But, but if we allowed it, then it, it, he could put any size battery storage on his property because he'd be pulling it in from the grid if, in fact, Eversource wanted to buy it. So to go back to your question, Bill, I would say I do not agree with no, I, I don't, I don't, well, I think it's too much of a blanket statement to say you could put in any size in because you can't put any size solar in on your property without utility approval. That's exactly, approval. that's the qualifier. They, they, you got to, you got to, and you need, depending how big you want to put in, they need, they'll actually have to give you special dispensation. They do have some kind of a fair formula. I don't, I mean, I'm not a guru on that by any stretch, but you just can't go and put in any size solar on your house, you can't put any size, you couldn't put any size battery in. The grid, the utility grid has to approve it. We just don't want to turn into Pasadena, Texas. Just the uh, things that are coming, um, not necessarily today or within the next year or two, um, but eventually we're going to start seeing behind the meter battery um, for industrial areas, um, specifically for big businesses um, that require a lot of energy. Um, so they'll be, they'll be doing pretty much um, kind of like what Michael's been saying is sucking off the grid in order to buy energy at a low price. That's what they're gonna end up doing with behind the meter. But that's not how these standalone systems work. These standalone systems are strictly regulated with ever sourced in the DPU and the DOER to absorb renewable energy resources and those only. Um, so I guess that's, and batteries as a technology is as a, as a standalone system, storage system, very reliable, very safe, very, very few incidences in the States ever about battery fires. Um, pertaining to the boat out at sea, uh, your battery's the most volatile while they're in motion and while they're being transported. Um, so that that has a lot to do with things. Who knows what happened on that boat? It could have been something, a puncture. Um, but a, a battery standing still, these are solid state batteries. These are lithium iron phosphate, no liquids in these. Um, and they don't, there's no um, heavy metals like there are with um, some other types of these energy storage systems that are already implemented out in the field already in other towns around the world, uh, around the state. Um, so just the stability factor of these battery, the battery technology has been around for 30 years. Um, we've had batteries in the state for 15 years. Uh, overseas has been using these batteries as storage, standalone storage for 15 to 20 years. They're decommissioning sites right now. Um, so there's the, the technology is not new. Batteries aren't new. We know a lot about them um, and technology grows every day with them and they become safer and safer as the day goes on. Um, so I just want to kind of clarify that the, the battery industry as a whole is a very, um, very stable industry and there's not many occurrences here in the States of batteries catching fire from a standalone storage system or a storage system, energy storage system on a grid um, situation, not a car in motion or anything like that. So logistically, what we need to do is take this to town meeting, requires a two thirds vote. Yeah. Uh, we do have an opinion of town council that your proposal as it was submitted does not meet the definition of the bylaw as it exists. The bylaw could be changed at town meeting and you see the text that the planning board is recommending. That once it gets to town meeting could still be amended on town meeting floor to produce a different result uh, that would require action by people who attend town meeting. Um, so uh, I guess I will ask you if you want to withdraw your application at this time, or would you like to have it continued at least until after town meeting to see what happens? Yeah, I, but I think I'd like it to, to continue the meeting until um, something comes about. Okay. We, 
Um, so that would be uh, May. You want to continue to a uh, book, Tom? Continue to a month from today, May seventeenth. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. So I'll make a motion, May seventeen, uh, to continue the public here to open the public hearing. and continue to May 17. Do you have a motion? Do I have a second? I'll second. I'll second it. Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion signify aye. 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 Any opposed? Are you opposed, Joe, or is that in favor? You moved your hand late. I, that's why I saw people putting hands up. If you would say, raise your hands instead of saying I, uh, I thought right. I would do both. So you, that was a positive vote? That was a positive vote. Okay. Yeah. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, see you on the 17th, Tom. Guys, Thank you. have a great night. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Remind me again, when is town meeting? Pardon? When is town meeting again? May third, May fifth, fifth, yes, May fifth, Thursday, 5th. May fifth. Oh, you're not got it. Yep, oh, my at God. seven p.m. Come on, guys. Yeah. Everybody's been spoiled by uh, earlier meetings. <laughs> They're trying to erode the quorum again. Uh, okay. All right. Um, so I think signs is pretty much done. Did yes. any technical corrections to signs? No, I haven't made any changes to that one. Talking about signs, I went by the mobile station the other night. Is that thing internally lit? Was it grandfather? I mean, Which the old one? Getty? Yes. Yes, it, it was grandfather. Yeah, okay. yeah, that is grandfather. Okay. Once you put up a sign, you can keep it up. You can change the plastic. You can go from uh, this is a case that came out of the, one of the auto miles in Dedham or whatever. So you can go from same size sign. You can go from Chevy to Ford to Cadillac to whatever you yeah. want, Toyota. Uh, you change the plastic. You can still keep the uh, 45 foot high sign. But the blue lights around the car wash are not grandfathered in the blue ring lights. Yes. That one kind of slipped by. Yes, it sure did. I went by the North Alley Fire Station last week at about 9.30 and every light was on in that place, inside, outside. And by the way, I had a dream that the tobacco shed on our property caught on fire and I called the fire department. And I said, in the dream, they'll be right here. And they never <laughs> showed. <laughs> they had to turn off every light before they left. Yes. Um, See if they had battery storage. And... Yeah. Any uh, comments on special permit? Um, there are only a couple of things that I changed significantly going from two years to three years for expiration. And some of the other parts, uh, Ken, I just dropped off all that part of uh, the, all the planning board stuff. And just for the purposes of getting this through, I thought um, a lot of that statutory anyway. And when we voted to accept the statute creating planning boards back in the 50s, we sort of incorporated a lot of that anyway. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it, it, I, I think I've maintained your your format substantially there. And um, thank you for putting that together because that was really helpful. 
so I sent that around to everybody. I don't know if anyone had any comments on that. I didn't have anything of substance, but I had some grammatical. Well, we'll see if it's my error or Ken's error. Well, oh, 6.5.1, the end of the first line, you have with the with the. At least the version I got. 6.5.1. Under special permits. The first line, yeah, with the with the. Okay. And the that and the last line of that paragraph, if you want to be consistent, you would either use SPGA or I think you would capitalize those four. Yeah, the words. SPGA. Yep. Like I said, nothing of substance. Nope, that's that's fine. That's the the uh, at one time the attorney general's office was much laxer about allowing corrections of typos and things like that. You, you but, couldn't change you couldn't change anything. You couldn't correct a little a, a period. Yeah. Um, so you know sometimes it, 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 there you, you find that a uh, uh, a comma got left comma got left in when the clause it, it modified was taken out and then it's all oh, it could be read two different ways you, you have to amend it to take that mm -hmm. out oh. format it format errors couldn't be done and then yeah, for a while when bob ritchie was the attorney general it was much easier to just correct things yeah Anything else? That was my error because I was tinkering with that paragraph. Punctuation is important. You know, if you say what's what's that in the road ahead, or if you say what's that in the road, comma ahead, or Second Amendment, a well-armed militia, comma blah 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 blah. So does that mean both the militia and the individual? Let's eat, mom, with or without a comma. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So oh. get me those. Get me those couple of changes, Bill, and I'll send everything into uh, the uh, what you call it, town administrator. Yeah. Send it to the town administrator. Copy it to Jennifer. That's I'm going to send them to both those, both people because I only Jennifer sure is a, Jennifer is away this week, but she'll um, okay. She'll yeah. have it. Yes, I will make those changes. Town, the town uh, clerk also needs the stuff because she's got the public hearing. Yeah. Notice. Okay. I'll make that small change to reduce it down to 5% on the uh, solar. We'll go to town meeting and see what happens. On the... Uh, Solar on the battery storage, should we include anything about shielding from public view or do we figure that the shielding that's already in there on solar is adequate? I think what we have there is adequate. Okay. Uh, in fact, I think that's the word we use, adequate. Okay. Which we can argue about another time. Okay. So Ken, is there anything we need to wrap up for the FY22 work program? Um, well, I think we put inclusionary zoning aside for now. That was the, the inclusionary housing payment in lieu of conversation for now. I think um, as you are aware, the um, housing production plan working group committee um, will be going through a process which may examine that particular regulation. Um, so I don't, I don't think um, as far as what we've established as a work plan for this year, um, there is anything, you know, to further, um, unless there is something that we want to look at 
and then continue on in FY23. Um, you know, because as you're also aware, there's various um, things that we were looking at and we kind of put off to the side, particularly for the inclusionary housing work, um, like planning board rules and regulations. That's something that's um, in the back of my head as something that needs to be worked on. Um, and that's kind of, you know, incorporating where you have it in various areas and in various documents that there is a singular document that um, would be helpful for the board. Um, and so, I mean, that's something um, that's um, probably outstanding and has been for a while, um, but that could be something that we can continue to work on um, now that you've gotten your zoning bylaws um, and unless there's some other research topics that you'd like to look at. Okay. One thing we had talked about some years back was um, some sort of a development roadmap or a series of like brochures on how you navigate um, town bureaucracy. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, like a permitting guide. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I and put that's... one together many years ago, and it was okay. I can. I can send you a copy of it. I still have it on a computer, okay. and whether or not it's appropriate, we can decide. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think that's always a good tool, um, especially for a town like Hadley, um, particularly when it comes to the redevelopment that's happening along your Route Nine. When you have when you have um, applicants or interested parties coming into the planning board asking for waivers of site plan, or you know looking at new uses along Route Nine, um, so definitely I think is is a helpful tool. And if the town doesn't have one, they should. So I do think that that probably is, um, you know, something to work on. Okay, so we'll add that to the FY23 permitting. Yeah. Yeah. Or the 23 uh, work plan. Yeah, and it's not too early to start talking about the 23 work plan for that case. I mean, you already mentioned it, Bill. So that we can get that, I mean, be nice to get that We'll, we'll know well we'll know in two weeks if we got our budget increase that we've asked for for PVP so we've asked for 12,500 I think is the number bill so we've increased that because we've been staying at 7500 for years and the price has been the same but obviously the hours has been reduced accordingly because prices go up so Jim, I think he, I remember the flow chart that you presented, and it, it is a good idea, but it's it, there is a limiting factor depending on the board. We've all seen various boards change. I remember when the Zoning Board of Appeals was very strict and they adhered to the letter of the law. Then the Zoning Board of Appeals changed members, and all of a sudden they said, well, this neighbor is kind of a nice guy. We'll give it to him. And so whether it's the Conservation Commission, the Planning Board, there are changes and certainly boards sometimes reflect the personalities of those people on it. And we don't always see the collective laws enforced in the same way. So the flow chart may be a good idea and a good roadmap, but uh, the drivers of the automobiles sometimes are the, the problem more than the flow chart. I think maybe if we, I, I understand exactly what you mean. And I think if, we have some a, a permitting guide with some buy-in from um, from the ZBA and from the Conservation Commission uh, that uh, it might might help bring a little more consistency to the the process. Is good point. Yeah, well point. Chicken. Um. So, anything else that's out there that you? really think a up and coming planning board like ourselves should be have should have well i think you know and this was um i had brought it up um and it was more so a research topic 
particular to parking. And I know parking is very, you know, is one of those topics that in Hadley, considering um, development along Route 9 and uses that may have existed for a long time, then have recently changed that type of use, that that conversation um, usually, you know, is met with the parking bylaw that currently exists works for the town. And if it's working for the town, I think that's that's great. Um, and if you think that, um, you know, that conversation is moot, then I'll move on. Um, but it is this discussion about the types of um, parking spaces per type of use, um, rather than a singular calculation, which is currently being employed by your commercial site plan review. Mm -hmm. I um, agree, Ken, that it is working okay because it gives us a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, certainly the, the five or six page documents that many towns have regarding types of businesses, how much parking you should have, but things change on Route 9. For example, Echelon is a great example from an auto parts store with a few cars now to a very popular restaurant with more cars. So sometimes you know, it can be grandfathered in as a restaurant, question mark, question mark, or if it's an automobile parts, uh, uh, that makes it even more difficult. So I think it's working okay. It's never smooth. It's never smooth in any town. Yeah, I'm, I'm, Ken, I'm willing to look at it, but the only problem is like Bill said, today it's a, it's a, it's a business and it requires six spaces Five years from now, it's a restaurant and it requires 25 spaces. How do you, how do you address how, you know, I think, it's a, I think it's a discussion we could have. How do you address those kind of changes? Because it's, this is not um, a make-believe. We have seen this happen yeah. more than a couple of times. Yeah, no, and, and, the, and, and you're totally right. I think Joe has provided that example. And that's one that even when I drive through Hadley, I'm like, imagine if this were a different use or if this turned into a restaurant and you needed this type of parking uh, capacity. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I you know, I, and I'm, I was just sharing um, yeah. the ability to, to maybe look at site individual sites, either um, for new development and or, you know, trying to figure a way to, you know, just take a look at parking in a different light. No, um, and, I think, and, and like I said, I'm, I'm, will, I'm will, certainly willing to discuss it. I'll give you a good example. Stables Restaurant probably has, I want to guess, four to five to one parking for the size of the building. Mm -hmm. You go by there on a Saturday or Sunday morning, there's not enough parking. Uh, you're right. Yeah. And it's, and you, you go by somebody like a uh, auto zone. They have two for one parking. They don't even need one to one parking. <laughs> but what happens if it changes? And you know, I mean, I, like I said, I think it's a, a good discussion to have. Maybe there's a way. I'm not against. I'm by no means, I'm against looking at it, but. We're looking at it from, you know, the three of us that have been around for a long time have seen these things happen and change. And, you know, how do you plan for that? Right. So, yeah, you know. I'd like to, I'd like to in investigate a hybrid where you have the two for one, but you only have to pay based on your use. So you we, have, we have, we already allow that. We you allow, allow the reserve? We yeah. allow that now. Okay. Yep. Yes. We don't, it's not in the bylaw. We just adopted it as a policy that <clears throat> if you don't need to, you don't need to pave anything. Right. You certainly don't need to pave more than you want as long as you have it and can bring it online when you need it. Yeah, I saw the reserve parking when we were looking at the hotel, but I didn't see where that was in the, in the code. So that's just a, that's yeah. how we, we've been handling it. A gentleman's agreement. I mean, I don't know if it makes sense to codify that. But yeah. Okay. I mean, nothing in the bylaw says it has to be paved or it has to be gravel. You simply said you have to have two for one parking, and you can meet that just by. You really need to meet that by having the space for it. Yeah. Yeah. 
So without having to amend the bylaw, that is the, exactly the kind of thing that can go into rules and regulations. Right. Mm -hmm. That our interpretation of uh, um, that that's where that that belongs. So that would uh, that would be a perfect item for there. Yeah. That that came about to just a, a real quick history. There was an industri an industrial building planned on Mill Valley Road. A number of years ago, it's going to be forty thousand square feet. They were going to. They had enough property, enough place on the parcel. It was large enough, but they were going to. By the two for one, they would need eighty thousand square feet of parking. And the owner, or the proposed owner, says we only need ten thousand square feet of parking for our business. We says why should we pave eighty thousand? And that was when we came up with this idea that if you can provide for it just put down what you need and just call the rest reserved. That's why you'll see on a lot of places, reserved, reserved, reserved. Yeah, I'd seen it, but I just didn't know where that was, where that came from. Yeah, okay. So, oh, you know, I think also for the parking, uh, we like to say yes, but sometimes it would be helpful to have a tool to say no. So if, you have a regulation that says a restaurant with a drive-through has to have 24 spaces plus you know, whatever, whatever. And someone comes and says, I can do it here. I have two to one, but no, I'm sorry. You cannot put a restaurant on that parcel. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. It's I, also, I, I, oh, go ahead, Bill. They are probably not too early to remind you to keep get your bills in for the end yep. of the fiscal year. Yeah. Yes, you're the board that I, that's what I, because I know that's a request that I will always work towards that. And you always have it <laughs> by the uh, end of June um, that you can act on that. Um, I think one of the other things is to re-explore some of the content that exists where the mat, where the planning board is a lead on um, ideas that are brought forward and recommendations of the master plan. And that's just in like an ongoing um, conversation, you know, and you address some of it based on the ease of, of um, the amending of the zoning bylaw to make it easier to read and easier to navigate um, this discussion about solar housing um, ideas and um, um, keeping in mind the types of development that's coming to the town and, and regulating those. Um, but that's just, you know, and this, this that, that particular um, task is more so of some things that may pop up in conversation. I know that um, the planning board, depending on what comes of the housing production plan, um, those conversations about housing will be coming forward towards the end of the year. Um, this, uh, not the fiscal year, but the end of this calendar year, um, as far as recommendations that may come out of that process. So, you know, I think being mindful of, of what your town plans say, and if the planning board is a lead on either, um, negotiating those bylaws or policies that we at least bring it to the forefront and identify what those are. So am I correct? I think we asked you to put together um, the master plan implementation arrayed by departments. Did we not? Um, I don't recall that. I, I think what I only did was just the planning board. Um, and I think I have a, a, a document that I created, which identified the tasks of the planning board. Um, but I think that it could be helpful um, if there are leads um, that are identified in the master plan um, and identifying what those leads are and then having that conversation. Um, okay. Sure. Okay. So is there anything on this that... Uh, well, maybe maybe the master plan implementation is something we could take up in our May meeting. Sure. Yes, that'd be a good idea. Okay. 
at least to get a better handle on the scope of the project. That works out uh, nicely. Um, May 17th is the town election. So we cannot, oh, we just continued something to May 17th, didn't we? Oh, we did. Okay. Lord. I'm going to re, uh, I, I'm going to make a motion to amend my prior motion Yep. Uh, I guess we'd have to look at uh, move him to June seventh. Yes. Okay. I will. Um, I will email him to let him know why okay. we had to do that. Okay. But uh, we, so we can't can meet hold. With Ken. We can meet with Ken. We can meet with Ken on the seventeenth, May seventeenth. That good for you, Ken? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. You're moving him to June June seventh. We're moving uh, the Z battery storage. Yeah. ZP battery to uh, June seventh. June seventh, and that's when we have the Sikowski dual, correct array public hearing. Okay. So I I think the likelihood of uh, the ZP battery is not going to overload us because there will be uh, in all likelihood. Uh, He'll just have the same question I asked him tonight. Yeah. Does he want to continue or uh, withdraw? Um, I don't have anything else. I I don't care. Ken. Okay. Thank you, Super Ken. I uh, almost forgot the, the PVPC announced at the regular meeting last Thursday that Mr. Comia has been promoted. Oh, oh. yeah, there's that. <laughs> the, ex, uh, the assistant director, of, I forget exactly the title. Yeah, deputy director of uh, land use and environment. Good. Congratulations. Thank you. That stars on your shoulders or stripes on your arm, Ken? <laughs> we'll Do you have an expense account now? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Um, but th that, that goes to um, Jim's comment about the, um, the, uh, the cost of services. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, now it's going to cost us more. Yeah, now, just, now we're, we're going to get hours in half. We're going to get less for more. Is that how it goes? Yeah. We're going to work we're working with management. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like tuition. The candy bar gets smaller, but you you pay more for it. Um, well, I think this brings up a great great point too, and I do this with some of the other planning boards um, with regards to identifying grant opportunities. I know. Um, there are grant opportunities, especially if there are larger type projects, um, like looking at master plan implementation and specific bylaw um, amendments and or other planning type efforts. Um, so I always keep that in mind. Um, and don't be surprised if one meeting I'll say, okay, does the board, you know, is the board um, amenable to you know uh, a grant that's being applied for on behalf of the planning board um, especially if it's a planning type um, task um, so you know and that always is 
adds to the value of the work that we do uh, at PVPC as well as um, to help support the things that you're trying to accomplish in Hadley. Um, so that's just a that's just a comment. Um, but you know, I'm look forward to the following year um, again. And um, yeah, I think it's gonna. I always enjoy working with the, with this planning board because it's a lot of hard work and a lot of hard discussions that are happening here. Great. Well, thank you, Ken. We appreciate we appreciate the help. Yeah, we're glad we you're along for the, the trip. We we appreciate any comments on next, uh, possible grants. Right. Okay, so um, we'll see you on the seventeenth then. Yes, I will. Okay. You 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 gentlemen have a great evening. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Okay. The motion. Okay. <laughs> we got a we got a few bills to cover here. Um, first one is. Um, our pay for the first quarter, entertain a motion to, for the first quarter of $575 to pay for our first three months of the year. So moved. I'll second. second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. The next one is to pay the uh, Gazette for the legal notice in the newspaper for the uh, uh, public hearing, and it is for five hundred sixty-eight dollars and eighty-four cents. So no motion. Second. Motion second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next one is for the when I, when I pub, when I schedule a public hearing for Joe Tchaikovsky's uh, solar panel, I like to put a. Uh, um, an adder on it to revise our fee schedule. Seeing that the, uh, like I said, the legal notices, costs of legal notice have been all over the place. They're not going down. They just seem like they're continually going up. So rather than put a fixed fee, I would like to base the fee that applicants pay to the planning board for special permits or whatever to be the cost of the legal notice plus the cost of the mailing and then add 10% to that price to cover town administrative costs. So let's say that the um, legal notice is 350, mailing is say $25 or $10, whatever it might be. And then the, the uh, the total fee would be something like um, three sixty, be like thirty six dollars added on to so about three hundred and uh, what seventy, like right around four hundred dollars. Okay, the, the the town would get basically ten percent of the whatever the fee is. That seems like a reasonable number. It's a fair fair suggestion, and I'll second that motion. To schedule, uh, to schedule a hearing. Schedule a hearing to revise the fee schedule. And that'll be an across the board thing um, for most of our special permits. The only, thing that, the only thing that I won't change it for will be the uh, earth removal. And we've never had one of those yet. So I'm just gonna leave that one where it is to some, I don't know, I forget what the fee is, but something like a few thousand dollars because we're obviously trying to discourage that. Just one, one quick comment about earth removal for Mike and Mark, especially. Earth removal was the hot button in town for, for several years because of the construction of 116 and 91, in which they were taking a lot of gravel out of Hadley and the trucks were coming up and down. And that was, those were hot button items. Remember those, Jim? Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. So things come and they go. What was that? That was the, in the 70s or the? No, that was back in the uh, 60s. In the 60s, yeah. Well, yeah. I even had, uh, I remember we had some some uh, people who were kind of perturbed when there was the sod farming going on up at Tudrids. Yes. How, how much of Hadley's topsoil is going out under those rolls of sod? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and that was. Okay. Ahead. I'm sorry. Anyway, okay, so 
I will, okay, we have a motion and a second to uh, advertise the change in the fee schedule. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Um, there, that takes care of that. The 60s, so that's when the highway went in before South Hadley put up its water tower right in front of the, the uh, what, what do they call it, a, a view uh, rest area? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's that? Yeah, that, that. <laughs> Pictorial <laughs> Drake view or something? 116 was built uh, 58, 59. 59, yes. I remember them putting the roads up behind my grandfather's. I was a little kid playing in the dirt piles out there. <laughs> well, 116 existed in Holyoke and South Alley prior to that, right? Right. So it, was there, so, and it existed. The plan, the plan Michael, was to have 116 uh, help UMass uh, because it was growing rapidly, but it was going to extend uh, roughly where Applebee's is now, all the way to the intersection of 91 where the Colonial Hilton Hotel was. And then Roby Hubley found, what was the animal he found that scuttled it? Was it the oh. spade toad frog? I don't remember. Yeah, so he found but, but that. Did a 116 exist in Hadley prior to the four lane highway? No, it went through Amherst, North Amherst. It went through Amherst. Okay, yeah. but, but it, North it, it, exist, it existed, it just was in a different place. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, it went. It, One sixteen began over by Amherst College, right to the center of Amherst. So that was okay. And down was it North Pleasant Street through the center of North Amherst by Coles. That was One Sixteen. Okay. Okay. And then it continued on where, basically, where the old Shala Farm came out at One Sixteen. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So the bypass, obviously, then it continued from there. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. All right, Tim, we interrupted you enough. So go ahead. <laughs> but you're in the meeting. <laughs> yes. Anything else? Um, I think we already maybe touched on this in, uh, offline, but um, I think it did. I hear that it's Jennifer that needs to look, or is it you, Jim, about our website, why it no longer has our board members on our page and our our in our terms oh. like yeah you know, i'm i'm looking at the select board right now and they still have that says name title and term expires but for some reason that disappeared off of our our page so is that something we could ask jennifer to look at when she comes back or or was that removed for some reason oh no no yeah, I, I had a feeling it was something in, inadvertent. So I think what happened was that the whoever was hosting the website changed. Mm. Uh, well, actually, it's more than hosting the website. It's it's a sort of a subscription or it's a package uh. of um, from a company that designs websites for communities. If you fl fl flit, flit around on other towns, you'll see a lot of similar pages. Okay. Um, but uh, when the change was made, they were supposed to be bringing everything over that had been there. And um, I have not been in to make a change. I, I saw that Jennifer said that it was Jim's job to make changes, but <laughs> I don't doesn't know how. <laughs> at one point, I know I was sent a password to make a change, but I don't make changes, but I don't even remember if it's for this version or the prior vendor. Oh yeah, yeah. The only the only thing on the planning board is uh, William Dwyer. Nobody else is there. Right. I mean, it does have phone numbers on the side. It has your phone number and mine, Jim. Right. I see that, but it, it doesn't have the the board members. Right. Doesn't it say? Doesn't it say hours and then say Dwyer? <laughs> like come knock on his door or something. It says business hours Dwyer supposed to be during. <laughs> After well, business hours, you call Dwyer. After hours, you call Maximoski. Um, it says what our meetings are, but it doesn't say 
who the members are. And there are some links there that I guess are helpful, but they're no, nothing we ever set up. Oh. I haven't done a website since I did the church. We had a Cascade Styles um, uh, and that one, yeah, if you lose a link, you're going to lose a page, so. Okay. I will, I'll, call, I'll ask Jennifer about that. Okay. Anything else? Mr. Quinlan, do you have anything? Nope, just checking out the meeting. Thank you. Okay. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good night. Meeting is adjourned. Meeting is history. Thank you and thank you, John. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, gentlemen.